Thank you all for uh, participating in this. Thank you uh, for your questions and your comments. And at this point, I'd like to uh, toss it over to uh, Richard Crawick. And I'd like to read a little bit about Richard. Richard um, will be moderating our next section. He's the, the published fiction, poetry, plays, feature articles, creative nonfiction, most recently a novel, Les Paralyses, as a French original by Tutankhala Press. And um, he's worked for decades facilitating writing workshops in homeless shelters, women's shelters, and literary sites, et cetera. And um, he is a uh, community active, he's the founder of the Community Active Press, Jakar Press, and a member of the Cultural Committee. Richard, I welcome you and thank you all again for staying with us. Thank you. Wow. Everyone should put your hands in the air and shake them around, get some energy. It's like, it's been a long day. I just feel so overwhelmed with all these great ideas. Um, obviously, we're running uh, late as these things do go and people engage in intelligent conversation. So I'm going to be cutting my um, introduction short because what's important is not what the resumes are of these people but what's important are the ideas that they have and what they bring to the table. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Here is Maureen Taylor, who's a grassroots working class activist whose history goes back to the days of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in 1960s Detroit. I will be posting again the conference program. So if you wanna look at uh, a more extensive bio, um, you can check all the people out in that. Now I'm going to shut off my video and listen. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Sisters, you've been on my mind. Sisters, you're one of a kind. Sisters, you're leading the way to a new world. I wanted to start off with a bit of a lyrical piece. There was a lady that received an envelope and in that envelope was a key and it was a message. And the message said, go to this address to find peace, to find social justice and to find freedom. So she gathered up a couple of her friends and they got over to this address and it turns out this was a great big old apartment building. So she got the key and opened the door and all kinds of noise going on in there. And there was an apartment and she knocked on the first one and it says, this is the way to freedom. She opened the door and uh, said, uh, what's going on in here? And it was a bunch of black folks. We are mad, we are outraged, we're upset. We can't get the food right. We can't keep a job all matters of problems and whatnot going on. And so the freedom seeker, she said, well, I got this message. And the note said, walk this way. So, okay, why don't you all come out of that apartment and let's walk this way. All right, we all going to look for freedom, social justice, anti-slavery, uh, anti-racism. We're gonna go find those things together. And they walk a little bit down the hallway. And on the other side of the hallway, there's another door all kind of noise going on. They knock on the door and open it, and there's a bunch of Latinos in there. Well, what the hell are y'all arguing about? We can't get across the border, right? Our rights are not being managed. People are hurting us. People are saying ugly things about us. Say, so, well, wait a minute. We got the same problems. Why don't we go together? Well, okay. So here come the Latinos out in the hallway, and now we are fists are raising. We walking on. And here's another door. Well, what's going on in this door? It says, open this door to freedom. Open that door. And Native Americans in there raising big sand. They didn't took our land, the kids being sold off. You all know the drill. And we going down the hall because we didn't told these folks, you looking for basic needs. Latinos looking for basic needs. African-Americans is looking for basic needs. Let's go down this hallway and walk this way. So they walk and there's a bunch of folks and they get to another door, plenty of noise. Knock on the door, this way to freedom. They open the door, wow, what are y'all complaining about? 
This is the LGBTQ community, uh, 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 community. And, and we get killed because of who we like. We get killed because of who we love. Uh, losing our jobs, we got no right. Hey, y'all got the same problems. We're going down this hallway to get some freedom. You want to go? Yes. Get in the hallway. And we marching together. It's a bunch of us. We get to another door. Open it. And it's white people in there. Well, what the hell are y'all complaining about? We got, uh, we can't get health care and our kids are not being educated. We got all kind of environmental problems. Everybody's mad at everybody else and we can't keep job. What? That's the same argument going on in every apartment. There's a pattern <laughs> being developed here. You all want to go for some social freedom and some social justice and fight these uh, demons, whoever they are that are making our lives miserable. Yes, we want to go. Come on into the hallway. So we still walking. It's a bunch of us. Uh, we got folks demanding basic needs coming out of every door. This group got people in wheelchairs, hearing and vision impaired. Some of them are spiritually impaired. We got retirees, all kinds of people in these separate apartments. And they all fighting their own fight for freedom. But now they're coming out. And we get to what looks like the last door and it's partially open. And we push it open a little bit more. And what we see is a bunch of kids. And one of them's got a sign that says, I already died. Another one's got a sign that says, I'm about to die. And another group has got a sign that says, I'll be dead soon. They're not talking. They're not making no noise. They're just looking. And you can see in their eyes, what the hell are we going to do about their problem? We go to that back door because now we got all the apartments are empty. And we pull the curtain back and we're looking at these corporate rat bastards out there at the table and they're eating duck a l'orange. They got champagne, Chateaubriand. They eating ribs on the half shell, all kind of stuff. And we looking and, and, and it's a bunch of them. This one got a table and Marco Rubio is out there serving them. This one got a table, Herschel Walker, he's serving over there. Uh, and they're all over the place and they're all corporate heads, corporate heads, corporate heads. And they got their political friends right there serving them. And then the people are outraged. Let's go out there and kick their ass. No, we can do that, but we might need a better plan. What we better do is let's take a look at what can happen. They didn't trick us. And we are fighting for social justice in our own individual apartments. That is a plan that is now exposed. So to cultural workers, I certainly started off with a little bit of a song. Cultural workers, you all are very important. The people that write songs need to write songs about our fight and to get us encouraged to keep moving. People that speak the written word, get those words together and share those words so that we will understand and hear these messages together. People that paint pictures, get those pictures up, put them on the wall, put them on a piece of paper, make them into an airplane, airplane and shoot them across the room. We need all of that, the graphic artists, all of the cultural workers, get up, get involved and get busy. The time is now, read the room, more people voting in this last election that ever has voted before. Folks said clearly, we're sick of this mess. Now is the time. We're already in the hallway. We done emptied out all of these apartments and everybody is out here. And my bottom line is, I don't wanna organize and fight with people and fight with people who look like me. I wanna get together and fight with people that think like me. I'm going to end my remarks by quoting one of my favorite scholars. And that favorite scholar is a science officer Spock, the, the master. And he's having a conversation with James T. Kirk. And he says this statement, Jim, whatever happens, never forget that the needs of the many must always outweigh the needs of the few. So you writers, 
you readers, you sing, uh, singers of songs, get busy. We don't have enough of that going on. My name is Maureen Taylor. I work with the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization, and I'm not scared of shit. I'll go back on mute. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, no words. That was great, Maureen. Um, and I'm sure our next presenter is happy that he's appearing by film and not having to follow that live. Uh, Mark Lipman, we have a film from Mark Lipman. He's the founder of Vagbond Books and the Culver City Small Press Book Festival and is past recipient of the Joe Hill Labor Poetry Award. Um, so go ahead and take away the film, whoever's gonna run it. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. I'm sorry I can't be there live. I don't have an internet connection, so I figured I'd share this with you instead. In order to break with the past and move into a just future, which includes all of us, we must first come to an agreement that everything we have tried up until this moment has in one way or another failed. Elsewise, we wouldn't be in the position we are today needing to have this conversation. We wouldn't be having to fight the same battles that our grandparents won 50 and 100 years ago. Although many, if not all of us, are also activists and organizers outside of this room, we are first and foremost poets, artists, and thinkers. And that means our job before anything else is to envision that better future we seek and the pathways to get there. To do that, we must be constantly reevaluating what works and what doesn't work, and more importantly, what it is we believe to be true. Although I would hope we can all agree that we seek a world which is just and equitable for everyone, regardless of the conditions of one's birth, that regardless of one's gender, beliefs, or identity, we all deserve bodily autonomy and the basics of life which sustain our well-being so that we may all have that freedom we seek to live lives that reach our greatest potentials. To that, those basics, that foundation we all require, which in no way should be commodified for profit, are food and housing, education and healthcare, transportation and energy. Now, there are those who will say that this is utopian, that it's a nice dream that maybe someday far off in the future, when those alive today are all dead, there may be a world where there is such justice, just not now. Well, I say they're wrong. Everything we need to provide all of this exists in plenty today. All the housing we could ever need is sitting vacant all around us while hundreds of thousands of people sleep homeless on the streets. All the food we require to feed every person on this planet is there in plenty, while we pay farmers to destroy crops in order to keep the prices high for those who can afford it. All the teachers and institutions of learning are already there waiting to share their knowledge, yet we structure it so our educators and students alike are riddled with so much poverty and debt that they can barely survive, so that a handful of private interests can be filthy rich. And for healthcare, it's exactly the same. As for transportation and energy, what already exists built on our tax dollars could be made free to the general public today. And what infrastructure we need to upgrade, that could furnish an entire generation with well-paying jobs. Yet, I can hear the mantra now, how are you going to pay for it? The simple answer is the same way that we have unlimited financing to pay for war. So far, I don't believe I've said anything surprising. However, it's time to examine some of the far-reaching and what might be considered radical strategies and steps we must take in order to reach those truly achievable goals. First, in the short term, I think for the most part, the true left among us can agree that we do not have two political parties in the United States, or for that matter, genuine opposition between the dominant political parties throughout the Western world. What we have is a duopoly and deception between two sides of one political machine whose differences for the most part are purely rhetorical and window dressing designed to divide an otherwise united working class from obtaining the policy goals we seek to improve all of our lives. Over the last 40 plus years, the Democrat Party has acted as a barrier and a stopgap to protect a Republican agenda normalizing the most radical far-right policies while roadblocking any advancement from a true leftist movement. 
How did we get to the point where progressives have suddenly become pro-war? Many are not going to like what I have to say next, but we allowed ourselves to fall into a Republican-led trap in coordination with a neoliberal Democrat party that has for the last 18 years focused solely on dividing us based on identity. Identity politics has gutted a once united leftist movement. Instead of demanding policy positions that help all of us from political candidates, we have structured and rallied around those whose mirror reflection best fits ourselves and the demographics of those traditionally excluded from our political debate, but whose policy positions merely reinforce a right-leaning status quo. In 2004, it was the Republicans who led with an attack on gay marriage, not because they cared about gay marriage, but because there was a strong and united anti-war movement that was looking to defeat George W. Bush and reverse the course of war that he set us on. Ever since, the left has fractured into a thousand pieces to put demographics over policy. That's how we got Obama, who after promising us everything, only continued to bail out Wall Street while expanding the wars until it became so normal that the rank-and-file Democrats suddenly became the cheerleaders for what they had once stood united against. And today, Biden is merely carrying on the tradition of funneling all our national resources into funding new proxy wars to a chorus of gays from sheep posing as progressives. So, in the short term, we need to break with identity politics, to back those with the best policy positions, whether those candidates look like us or not. But that in itself is not good enough. Representative democracy ruled by election has utterly failed us, for unchecked money and insider manipulation of primary elections has completely decimated our electoral system to the point that we see it as a miracle if anyone who is decent breaks through all the obstacles set in their path and that as soon as they get into power, they get comfortable and start compromising too. So I say, if representative democracy has failed us, it's time for direct democracy to take its place. And that means, in the long term, we need to abolish elections altogether and move to a lottery-based system whereby anyone of a certain age can be selected at any time to serve one term in office with no special privileges, no lifetime pensions, or corporate lobbyist positions on the back end waiting for them. That, as a public service, you do your job for a set number of years and then leave it having to live with the consequences of the policies you set in place, just like everyone else. What we would vote on instead would be the policy priorities that this new body would have to work on in their time in office so that they don't get to set their own work agenda, but we do as an entire population. Now, the immediate backlash we will hear is that the average person is too stupid to make such important decisions. We here may even agree with that statement. So, the first thing that would happen in such a new configuration is that we would make education the top priority for the nation. We would make sure that everyone in the country received a good education so that no one would be too delinquent to serve. The second pushback we will hear is that extremists will get into power, as if they're not already there. It's true, we would get such a cacophony of voices and perspectives that it would truly be an honest representation of who we are as a people. And like a true democracy, it will be slow and messy at first. But there are more than two narrow sides of a sliver in this world, and once real people come together who have to live with the consequences of their actions, we will see much better policies come about as a result of those debates than what we have today, which is controlled primarily for the benefit of those who are obscenely rich, who don't care about the well-being or the future of this planet. The only caveat I would make is that this service would be voluntary, that anyone who wishes to opt out may do so. And this is how we break the control of the corporations and their two-party monopoly over our lives. As cultural workers, the best way we can help advance these strategies is to let these ideas resonate within the work we are already doing. For our main job, as always, is to provide the vision for our greater organizational movement. Thank you.
Well, going through the internet, I'll give you that snap, Mark. Um, lots of wonderful things. We're going to have some good discussion at the end. I have a couple of questions I want to throw out everyone to consider after we hear our third presenter, Damon Williams, who's an organizer, social activist, movement builder, founding member of Let Us Breathe Collective, Breathing Room, and co-host of Ergo Radio. Damon. What's up, y'all? I definitely appreciate that film, After More Rain, just in terms of rhythm. Like those, that was very precise <laughs> information. Uh, and, and I'm here and I'll just show y'all how I'm gonna get down. I got this little scattered paper of notes for our flow. Um, so in, in talking about revolution, um, you know, just give a little bit more context of myself. I'm 30 year old organizer from South Side of Chicago um, that has, you know, come up in this what we would call movement for black lives iteration. Uh, I've been part of building abolitionist movement, not only in my city, but in larger connections. And I just kind of want to shout out some of the, the legacy and lineage from which I speak. You know, I, I think it's important, especially everybody probably don't know me to, you know, you can't just become up here making claims. Uh, and, and I want to ground that this comes from a tradition, which I think is also important to the things I want to offer. So just want to shout out uh, Barbara Ransby, Miriam Kaba, Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, Robin D.G. Kelly, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, The Boggs, Grace Lee and Jimmy, um, the legacy of Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party, SNCC, and I, you know, there, there are many offshoots that are connected and intersect with those legacies and traditions. And like, you know, I, I work to embody uh, a lot of the principles that those people have, you know, made more possible in this world. So with that, right, the question of strategy of the cultural worker uh, relative to, to this thing here, we're talking about revolution. There's a there's a, a famous quote that almost I appreciate it becoming cliche is that, the, you know, the job of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible, which I agree with and which I think is true. Uh, but I'll challenge us or provoke us to um, a responsibility that maybe comes before um, or proceeds irresistible. I would say that the job of the, of the artist or the culture worker is to make the revolution legible. Um, I'll say it again. I think before we worry about it not being resisted, I think we need to make it legible and make it seen. Um, and so what, what I want to offer is one affirmation, one, I don't know, maybe let's call it confidence to all of y'all here. This is a beautiful body and I love anytime I'm able to connect with the league. I think what y'all do here at Lerna, uh, I'm just excited to know that this exists in the world. And I appreciate you, Adam, uh, for bringing me here. Um, and I think a lot of times we get a, a lot of anxiety and can be very defeated when we talk about this marvelous word, word revolution and our relationship to it. Uh, and I think it's because a lot of times we're thinking of the proper noun revolutions that we think of, the big R revolution. And I, I want us to encourage like lowercase revolution uh, in the notion of it is a process and not an event. Um, and so when I say we need to make it legible, uh, you know, I grew up with, as I came into age and into consciousness, as I, you know, as I was studying in school, as I was getting activated, I had this idea that there was these great revolutionary black centered movements from 1955 to 1975, roughly. Uh, and people my age were saying really smart shit that people my age don't say now anymore. Uh, and I was discouraged as to like, yo, like what happened? Where, where did, where, how did, why was it defeated? Why did it end? And yes, we, you know, there was a slap down. There was a, a COINTELPRO, we did have to recede. There was fracturing, but the process continued. And so the thing that I want us to like claim is that revolution is happening. And I think it's very hard for us to fate. We call people, the people, the masses, the workers, the, the proletariat, the front line, you know, we name the folks we want to be it deeper in community with that we may not yet have reached or may not be connected with. And we can't start by obfuscating the fact that there has been an ongoing process that has not ended. And it is, does not have to be absolute. Um, it does not have to be linear, it does not have to be singular, and it does not have to center state power, right? S the state power, overthrow, taking, sometimes those things are really fly and those are some like re really dope history stories and lessons that like invigorate and also real change and material shifts can happen in that time. But the, 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 even the idea of taking state power is the result of the process, not the affirmation of it. 
right? Um, and so before people get to the place of making decisions that are life and death, right, which is usually the histories that we think about the most where people were willing to die or were willing to challenge other people's life and existence over these ideas that we can call revolution. Before folks get there, there is a process, there is a connectivity, there is a nurturing that is happening um, that I think we need to affirm and claim. And we can't claim it as, as if we've lost already, right? Or we can't claim it centering the counter-revolution or only talk about it when counter-revolution isn't present. Because the, the theory that I've learned is that whatever we do, they're going to react. Whatever we do, there's going to be a counter. There's going to be a, a, a counterweight, counterbalance. And if we, we get defeated or if we center or focus on that, we are missing the fact that we have so much to offer our people that's already been happening. Um, so just to give my, my definition, I think communally defining things is important. Let's not like skate past. Revolution to me is the creation of new systems and structures that transform realities, right? And so there are mutual aid efforts, there's political organizing, there's political education, there's childcare work, there, there's, there's direct peer-to-peer -peer health care that I'm sure many of your spaces are connected to that is happening. And I'm seeing a 40 something tiles from people that are all over the world. And I don't think we say right now we are a revolutionary movement outside of the space when we know we can say it with each other. And I think there's some healing that needs to happen around that. Some of that is McCarthyism. Uh, some of that is individualism. The fact that after a while saying I'm down with the revolution meant just put up with my bullshit and I can do whatever I want, right? The word got diluted a little bit. And so I think we did, we did need to restore some integrity to it. So being careful, I think is important and we can't be willy nilly and just throwing it out. Um, but again, it's not, it does not need to be absolute. It does not to be happening everywhere all the time at once. Everyone is not gonna participate. Um, the, the people that we have are enough already. Um, and that this is exciting, you know, like, bread is exciting, dancing is exciting, classes and learning is exciting. And for me, right, like I, I'm invigorated by this. I have a, I feel more empowered. My vision for what my grandchildren will be doing is grounded in this. I have a sense of purpose. And, you know, we can start our door knocking or our canvassing with how we're going to overthrow the man. But that brings up like a red X in the brain just on like a primate homo sapien level first. Let's start with the green check of people understanding that we can learn, we know how to, we remember how to feed each other and we're going to do more of that. And you can be a part of that. We know how to build shelter. We are doing it now. And there's so much more to be done. What an opportunity that is, not only for your immediate needs, but for your sense of humanity, right? Like that as the way we enter and, and train our tongue and make it legible that when, we're, when people are talking, you know, in Chicago right now, there's an initiative called Treatment Not Trauma that is really successful. And it comes out of, we just had 90% in three of our wards vote to uh, have mental health crisis first response. I'm trying to use the language. And a reinvestment in, into the public health centers again, as most of the public mental health centers have been closed. Um, and, you know, folks... Think, see is a good thing, gets 90% approval and not having cops as first responders, right? Like we can talk through all the politics and why it's a good strategy and people get excited about it. And how much more excited would they be if like, yo, the people who believe in this are the ones that wanna transform this whole thing, right? I think a lot of times, you know, I think abolition is one of the most important thrust in our revolutionary tradition right now. It's at the center of a lot of my political work. Um, and it's so exciting because it demands a deeper responsibility of people. It demands a deeper presence. It demands people to be new people, right? Um, sometimes the way we talk about healthcare or even like income redistribution, we talk about it very passively of waiting to receive something more, which we do need, right? We do need those things, but revolution can't be demanded. It has to, it has to be, be made. And so I think ab abolition, is so exciting because it gets us to that place. And usually when folks have like the veil or if you, you, we're not trained in talking about it, the thing they say is like, oh no, we can't get rid of the cops and military because people are dangerous or because the schools ain't right. Or, you know, you know, there's all these domestic people name all the things that we want to address, <laughs> right? And so what if we started with, yo, all of the things that we're afraid of, all of the things that are harming us, we want to transform that reality, 
we believe in revolution. And I just feel like, again, to the, to, the, to the line is, I don't think that that is legible to most people. I don't think even when they talk about DSA and they talk about the Green New, you know, all the things that I don't want to get into the nuances of, all the things that we generally agree with. I think people see that as left or like, what is that? I think that's a playing into dichotomous binary thinking. We need to be dialectic or multi, we need to be multiplicitous, right? And so, yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna let me gather my thoughts to close this because I feel like I'm getting close to seven minutes. Um, and so boom, then what is the strategy? The strategy then becomes a little bit more human in the, in I think what I'm offering of, how do we then develop that revolutionary capacity once folks see it, recognize it? Uh, because to the, the, the challenge against irresistibility, it's very easy to not resist something you don't see. But then when you do see it and recognize it, how do we develop the capacity? Because I've had the privilege and the experience of what happens when you have a bunch of people that are willing to show up and receptive, but are still struggling, right? What if we get past the I agree or disagree point. Once, what happens when we're in the room with each other? I'm sure many of y'all had the experience of folks who believe in collectivity and transformation, and then it's fucking hard to work together. And that's not personal, right? Like that's not individualistic, that's systemic. That is neoliberalism, that is capitalism, that is Western philosophy inhabiting our bodies, and it's happened at mass. And it's gonna take work to, to un undo that, I believe abolition is the creative undoing of harmful systems, right? So we have to abolish a lot of the toxic, toxic individualism, patriarchal, cis-hetero, um, classes, things that we just do <laughs> on a regular basis that then cause this friction that make it hard for people in their, like, in their bodies to sit in the room together. We, no matter how many plans or how many outlooks or mission, mission and vision statements we make or what we're gonna do in 30 years, if the people aren't present to be able to stay together to do it after they agree that we need to transform this place and we're the ones to do it, that's where I think the work is. And so a lot of times that can get, I think gener generationally dismissed as like hoo-ha or you know, people don't, it's are apolitical. Uh, and I disagree. I believe the way in which people struggle to relate to each other is of the most structural consequence and hyper-political. And so when we're talking about a budget or if we're talking about a legislative process or if we're talking about how to have a school council or how to have a food program, let's, let's go back to bread, right? Like if everybody agrees we need food, everybody wants to know how to farm, everybody wants to figure out how to pass it out. But if it gets to a point where people can't be together for more than six months, those deliveries will stop, right? And so we need to, I think, work through that. And then I will close with saying, again, we can't demand it. There are things that we can get. There are material benefits that can en enlarge in our capacity, but we cannot demand revolution. If right now, Nancy Pelosi and Mike McCarthy or whoever came to agreement, like, you know what? It's in our, our self-interest to have Medicare for all right? Like, okay, I, well, I'll listen to the polls. You win. We're going to do it. They couldn't do it if they tried. They do not have the capacity. They are not in the human position to be able to take care of human beings. Um, and so that gives us a deep responsibility. So when we talk about abolishing the police, it's, it's not just a, a demand of them to retreat. It is we have to abolish the police. We have to learn how to show up to be the people that we call upon. And that's gonna take major investment that you know large economies would need to participate in, but that's gonna take new people. And who's doing that? Who's doing those classes, right? Like after you get the person to agree that the cops suck, then what do they do? And that is revolution. Uh, and so I'll kind of, I think that was a cool way to stop. I think that's a, that, that was a bar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our work is to make revolution legible and then is to transform ourselves with our people. Appreciate you. All right. Excellent, excellent job, Damon. Wonderful. Um, we're going to have a discussion. I'm going to throw a few questions into the chat that I had when looking at the title of this originally, Break with the Past, The Future of Ours is Ours. Obviously, people can ask anything they want, say, say anything they want, but I'm really fascinated about this idea of legible because I think uh, making the re revolution legible is a profound uh, statement. We saw some of that. We saw that when Maureen told that wonderful, compelling story. We saw that when Mark was very specific in the policy that he wanted. We saw that obviously with Damon, everything he said, in particular coming down to the strategies. 
you know, um, what does it mean to you where you are in the spaces you're at to make the revolution legible? And I'll try to just call on people. Anyone can help me as I see hands go up. If I see a hand go up. I hope my hand's been up. Sorry, I'm okay. sorry, comrades. You know, my memory is terrible because it's related to this. We just got done with this very long contract campaign where we were fighting with the city. I work for the City Colleges of Chicago. I'm a tenured faculty member at Harold Washington. I'm the union steward. I call myself La Chingona and I have a big fucking mouth. And I'm like, Maureen, I don't give a fuck. You know, I'm ready to die today if I have to for the people. It's come to that fucking point. I am fed up. Um, but so one of the things, and I'm not going to answer your question, brother. I have a question for Damon and others, because this is real. One of the demands one of the contract because of myself and the president was this sustainable uh, this community colleges for the common good, which is really pushing for sustainable community colleges. Because I have students that can't see a doctor. They don't have a place to live. They don't have food. They don't have psychiatric medicine. And, and I see this as a, an opportunity to push forth revolutionary work because I have to go to the community and, and um, present it to them. Like, what are your needs? What can we do to connect? Obviously it's a bandaid. It's not gonna resolve their issues because we live under a capitalist system. But I guess my question, Damon, one, one I would love for you to come talk to my students, brother. Let's, let's connect. I was just chatting you when I got called upon. Would love it. They would love to hear your inspirational words. But how, how can we use these? I mean, I think the question is obvious, but as I'm stepping into this process, how, how, how do you foresee this kind of thing moving towards a sustainable community college, which is really about basic needs? How can we, how can I, Hesu, you know, and others make this like a revolutionary process? What, what do you think? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you make the, the fight for that public common space a revolutionary process? Um, one, I have faith in you. <laughs> so I want to start that like, some of the seeds of it probably are already happening and I want to have a humility to that and you know the space. Um, but, but you know, I always go to, to traditions and legacy. Um, and so if people know that f these things didn't happen on accident, you know, like uh, the, 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 they weren't there all the time, they've been challenged, they've been contested. Um, you know, for example, in Chicago, we have Malcolm X College and Kennedy King, as in Martin Luther King College. And Harold Washington. And Harold Washington, and Washington, Harold Washington Harold College. Washington. Mm -hmm. And it was not bureaucratic government people that made those choices or why those things exist. So I think just the history of that, I mean, just the history of the fight for Malcolm X College, which was connected to the Panthers and post like Panther work in the 60s and 70s here, gets you then talking about Malcolm X and the Panthers alone, right? Um, you know, one of Fred Hampton's strategies and Huey Newton's strategies were to go to these public universities. And so naming like, hey, you know, when these things were funded at their height, these were the type of things that young people, young black people, young indigenous people started to do and say, I wonder why they are being defunded to, to use a, an intentional word um, and what could be more possible if we were at that place, I believe asking that question and having those contexts will will be a a, uh, a very slippery slide toward, towards where we need to go. Thank you, brother. That's hugely helpful. And I'm Thank down you. to come wherever. Uh, let me let me put all contact in in the chat. Um. <laughs> okay. Next, who would like to make a comment, ask a question? You have a hand up there, Nikki. Maria. And Nikki has her hand up. Okay. Their hand up. You want me to speak on that? Uh, yes, Maria. Go ahead. Uh, Maria, go ahead. And then, and then Nikki. Okay. I just wanted to say, you know, what a beautiful presentation that was, uh, bringing us uh, down to the reality of we need we need revolution. It's not going to be changed. You know, the system is not going to be changed with. This reform, we need revolution, and we need to. And I love the term that you use. Uh, you know, making it legible or understandable to the people. Very correct. And that's why I believe the revolution in the demand helped to do that. When I was on the 18, uh, 18 day hunger strike here in San Francisco, and we got the police chief of police fired, and we got to uh, people to acknowledge in the whole of San Francisco the fact that there was police brutality. And out of that struggle, 
I was born the Mothers on the March, women who marched every Friday for the last eight years in front of the Police Officer Association demanding, you know, the, the abolition of the police, the charging of the killer cat for murder, and the, uh, you know, declaring the, the Police Officer Association a non grata organization. You know, it came out of that struggle. So, you know, and it, because we made those demands and people could identify with those demands. They could understand those demands. They feel that those demands were their demands. But we did that because we've been working around police brutality for all these years. And we've been doing this and you know what I think. The same thing as out of that struggle came out also the black and brown social club that we have where, you know, we do poetry readings, we do open mic, we do a lot of community organizing because we have made those revolutionary demands. Because people already know where they're at, you know what I mean? They know that they're being messed up. They know they're being oppressed, they know. But they need the ability to unite, to be together so that they can organize. So I think that's one of the, and it's not easy. And, I, and also I just wanna say that we need to understand that sometimes everything rises up and you get a lot of people to come and be, and other times you don't. We saw, we saw it during the George Floyd, and what did we do during the George Floyd too? You know, it's good to analyze that. We were not ready for that uprising, right? That was almost an uprising. We were not ready. We were not ready for that. We let it go by, you know, and the, and the police took it over. They even kneeled down in front of everybody. So I'm just saying, you know, brother, yes, I agree 100%. And, I, and I, you call it legible, I said, revolutionary demands. That means that people, demands that the people identify with, demands that the people recognize as their own, and that they can say, I agree with that. Yes, I want that. So beautiful. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. So it's a great presentation. Thank you. And can, I, can I respond directly okay. before? Uh, yeah, go ahead. And and I, then Nikki, you're up next, right? I appreciate that because you're, you're prompting me towards precision. Um, and also in that claim, I also came in late. So if I missed you talking about revolutionary demands and it sounded like I was making a like a, a, a jab or like countering that. I just want to clarify no, no. because no. I, I, I agree just with what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I just want to name, I've been a part of making many, many demands and have amplified many more. So I, I certainly agree. So let me let me be more precise in what I say, I because I, I was writing in shorthand. I say we can't demand revolution. I think to complete that sentence, we can't demand revolution into reality, right? Like, so, so we, that will require practice. And part of that revolutionary practice will be making demands as one, a way to engage and, and, and to directly resist power, but also to educate people. So I just wanna like, I'm not saying don't make revolutionary demands and I should be more precise. Um, and like in the, the, you know, the most prominent version of that, particularly when we made our abolitionist defund demands, saying that in the campaign, of like, hey, we are serious about demanding this, but we don't expect them to do it. And if they were to fall over tomorrow, it's still not the win that we would think it is. It is on us to do. So that, so I so I was more just wanting to emphasize practice and not diminish the importance of demands. I th thank you for that. All right, I see other hands. I think Nikki and I, I'm not the facilitator, but. No, no thank you so much today. for. Thank you so much for that. Um, it was incredible. And um, I really found the rhetoric that you framed inspiring um and also i apologize i have been in and out because i'm on a hotline with a uh I'm, I'm on a hotline shift for a jail um in my area and one of the things that we encounter with the abolitionist work that that we're doing here with the jail is that it's so hard to think beyond the systems that are you know and one of the things that i really saw in your presentation is you know the the path toward imagining transformation has to come through cultural work to some extent, because otherwise we can't um, imagine otherwise. And so I'm just curious, you know, as, and I'm familiar a little bit with your music and poetry, thanks to Adam, um, you know, so as an artist, I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about how you see um, art and abolition um, as connected. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for checking stuff out. That, that means a lot. Um, oh, man, yeah, that could be the whole the whole five hour thing y'all just did. <laughs> um, um, so I think first, at, at the most basic level, my analysis, even beyond myself, is there are very few things that gather people like art and culture. 
in having just sent out flyers to get people to a thing, the difficulty just on a, on a unit level to get 250 people in a space is by itself like a, a feat and hard, right? And then I'll go to our friends or I go to, and, and it's kind of routine in the cultural space, even if it's for a few hours. And so what happens then? And then it goes all, you know, at, at the capitalist level, it goes all the way to, you know, you go to a Rihanna or whatever concert and it's 20,000 people in a room. And that's just like a, an archeological feat, right? <laughs> like very few beings, species in the, the environment can gather at that large of a number. Um, and so um, what then could be possible if we are not just all as an audience looking at a stage, which is like almost like replicating our, our notions of power and we look to each other, right? If we all kind of like the same type of tune or the same type of picture or the same type of play and there's more than just like a talk back, right? Or more than just like a we are giving a few uh, proceeds to this organization. If, if, if that is actually where we activate people, right? If, if people are then moved to actually do mutual aid work or to actually get into restorative processes, that's like my, my ultimate goal, right? Like that art and that it doesn't have to be, you know, didactic, right? Like that you can come with art that's not the, the stump speech that we would do. Like we, we actually speak to people's spirit and soul and not just try to rhyme our, our ideal, ideology, um, actually have human to human engagement. And then that actually be the entry point into transformative organizing. Um, and then I think on, on a, on a uh, um, there is a more human, we wanna call it spirit level, right? Like one, it allows us to transcend time and space. So I'm only gonna be here for so long. And I really want to communicate with people that are gonna be here after me. Um, and I, I have been communicated to by writers and poets and rappers that are no longer here. And so with my sense of, of time and ancestry, right? Like, I, I, you know, Baldwin or Du Bois are artists, right? And, and, and you know, Grace Lee Boggs is, is an artist. And I, I, you know, it's probably literally, well, you know, I, I was gonna try to stunt and pull it up because usually I actually like have it on my desk. Um, and so that is, that is a, a conversation that I'm able to have that people don't have to be physically with me and we don't even have to be alive at the same time. Uh, and then that's revolution, right? I think one of the, the biggest uh, revolutionary villains that I use in teaching uh, and like he was obviously brilliant, but Eldridge Cleaver, I, I, you know, I, I would name as harmful. Um, and a lot of what I saw in his harmful choices, he, the way it was named is he had this thing of like revolution in my lifetime. Um, and, I, and, and I think that's arrogant and individualistic, right? Like I think I will exist and I have existed beyond my physical lifetime. Um, and so, you know, the abolition of chattel slavery took seven generations. Um, and there were freedom songs that passed through those generations. And there were people that existed in the fourth generation whose parent, grandparent, and great-grandparents lived and died in bondage. Their child, grandchild, and great-grandchild would live and die in bondage, but they existed for freedom, right? And they made that seven generation continuum possible. Um, and so I, I believe that it allows us to communicate in ways that our essays and our talk shows and our podcasts don't. Um, and similar to what I was talking about earlier about when we show up or to stay in circle together, you know, there are ways that this world hurts us. <laughs> there, there are ways that it, it takes things away um, and, and time and sound and rhythm and melody and tone and, and poetics and, and metaphor, like does something that literally physically feels good um, and replaces some of that. And so I wanna be able to communicate people beyond the level that I'm doing right now. Um, you know, um, I want folks who don't give a shit about <laughs> any of the words I'm saying to be able to take the meaning and the value and it still be legible, even if, it, even if we don't speak the literal same language. All right, I'll stop there. Adam. Thank you. I'll try to be brief because I know we're at our time where we're uh, gonna move into performances and I believe Damon is kicking off that next round. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about what I've learned from Damon and his sister Christiana Colon and the Let Us Breathe Collective, which they helped found um, back in 20. 
2015, was it? Or 2014? 2016? No, 20, 2015. 14, 14. 14, that's right. Okay, 2014. Um, and uh, the thing that um, is coming up for me right now uh, in relation to the conversation is that... Um, uh, well, I'll just say that Let Us Breathe in Chicago, um, for me, set a standard for what it can look like to um, do exactly what Damon just talked about, um, to uh, really <laughs> uh, merge art and revolutionary practice in ways that elevate um, what we call activism to both the level of art and the level of revolutionary work. And I don't want to uh, belittle activism and I want to be careful about us taking a superior attitude toward activism in general. Although I also agree with what uh, Christina and others have said about moving beyond just activism into organizing and revolutionary work. But um, uh, there are just two brief things I remember. One was, you know, I think it was the first year that Let Us Breathe Collective organized an event called The End of Silence, which was a um, performance of uh, poets and uh, musicians, rappers, uh, etc. Uh, in a theater, Stage 773, in the Lakeview neighborhood of Chicago. And immediately afterwards, um, the very uh, artist who led this uh, event led a... Um, shut down of traffic at one of the busiest na busiest intersections um, just a few blocks away. And, um, you know, did the thing where it wasn't just like chanting, you know, angry, kind of boring, repetitive chants the way that some of our protests have been. No, but really leading the way at making the art of like shutting down traffic fun and inspiring and um, you know, based in love and building a culture and creating a culture and changing the culture, right? Um, and, uh, of course, the the biggest thing that folks should know about that we don't have time to really talk about, and it would be arrogant for me to talk about it rather than Damon, is Freedom Square, um, which, as a land occupation, really set a standard for me of, like, we are taking up space right now, and we have to understand that there is an element of performance art to this act action of taking up space in public. And that term, performance art, can be used very pejoratively, but it also can express what is the highest aspect of our work when we're out in public. We have to embody a new world. We have to embody the vision of the world that we are fighting for, right? And to me, Let Us Breathe Collective is just the, the standard of that. But there are folks all over the world doing this and who know that it's it's really culture at the center of our work, right? And um, so I'm just excited to keep building and keep asking these questions about how do we, you know, continue to do this. And um, uh, Damon was able to come uh, to a, a land occupation we just had here on the north side of Chicago, um, where there's still a motion, and it, uh, folks are still in motion from that. It was called Rise Up Town, um, and kind of passed on the legacy of Freedom Square uh, to us. Um, and so, yeah, how can we keep, um, you know, taking seriously the art of revolution in the in a literal sense, right? I'll just end it there. Um, and our first uh, performer is going to be um, Damon. I thought what I'd do to kind of tighten it up slightly is just announce two people at a time. Uh, so the first two readers, presenters will be Damon. Williams and Kim Shuck, who's the seventh San Francisco Poet Laureate. 